welcome everybody and yourself, of course. OK, everybody, uh, welcome to this um, session and uh, it's about meet the CEO. And uh, in a moment, I'll uh, welcome our guest, Alex Sanchez. Uh, but I welcome each and every one of you to this opportunity to hear about in this conversation with Alex, to hear about the role of the banker and the uh, the attributes required. So, Kroiso uh, Echegid, welcome to you all. Uh, the Florida Bankers Association, as you can see on your screen, I think there, uh, of which Alex is the president and CEO. So the Florida Bankers Association and Bangor University were formed before my time, before Alex's time, before the Beatles time, were formed in the 1880s, I believe, within a, a few years of each other. And uh, although we didn't know of each other's existence at that time, we certainly do now and we're getting closer. And Alex is coming over uh, for a couple of weeks uh, in um, about a month's time uh, to work with us here in Bangor University. Uh, so some similarities in terms of our uh, origin, in terms of uh, dates, uh, not quite similarity in terms of our temperature. I did look it up. Uh, they're slightly warmer than we are at the moment, uh, uh -huh. whether you measure it in Fahrenheit or um, degree centigrade. And I know that many of you who are attending today will be from places which are much warmer and less windier and stormier than we are. Financial services uh, over the decades has been through a few storms. Uh, we've all, regardless of what industrial sector we're in, we've all been through a stormy time during the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. And this is an ideal opportunity for us to hear from Alex about his own background, about the Florida Bankers Association, their view of what it takes to be uh, a responsible banker and at the end there'll be an opportunity for you to ask some questions which you can pop into the chat area and our colleagues will be monitoring them and then I'll draw them in at the end when we have a question and answer session. That's enough now uh, as a general welcome. Specific welcome to Alex now. It's a few years since we were able to meet pre-pandemic uh, travel restrictions but as I say Alex is coming over um, in a few weeks time. Uh, the bio of uh, Alex is on the screen there. I hope you can see it and uh, welcome Alex. Do you want to say a few words about, about your own route to becoming there? Anything you want to pick out from the First bio all, or Stephen, edition? Stephen, it's great to be with you and, and the team at Bangor University and of course the students. Uh, looking forward to our conversation today and to the students, I really welcome your questions. Uh, that's what makes it exciting for me to be here uh, today with you and then hopefully in a, in a few weeks at the university. But, uh, you know, uh, it's great to be with you. Thank you for inviting me and I look forward to sharing our thoughts this morning. That's right, because of course it is this morning where Alex is uh -huh. and, and where some of you are, it's uh -huh. heading towards the evening. But regardless of whatever the time is, the message that uh, I'm sure Alex is going to bring to us is going to be very valuable. Uh, Alex started out uh, in, in a legal background, Alex, uh, and, and how come, how did you migrate into financial services yes, and the Bankers I, Association? Uh, yes, you know, I, I, uh, I practiced law and, uh, and then actually was the uh, deputy general counsel for one of our banks uh, and, uh, and, and so was with a bank. Uh, and then with time, this opportunity came up, uh, which is I think going to be part of our discussion about you don't know where your the roads are going to take you when you graduate from school and, and earn your degree. Uh, be open to the opportunities in the in the adventure in the journey. Uh, and so this position came open, and I always enjoyed banking. I, I think you know always enjoyed the industry. Bankers make dreams come true. They're the ones who provide the capital to make people. Uh, homeowners or allow them to buy or start a businesses. Most people don't have capital to do that. They need to get it from somewhere. And one of those places are our banks globally. And that's what bankers around the world have in common. And uh, so it's an important role that all the bankers play. All of you on this uh, on this Microsoft Teams uh, uh, call. And and uh, so that, that's how I got here. And uh, I have the honor and privilege of, of seeing bankers 
and working with closely with them and seeing co what they do every day uh, for our economy. Great. OK, and then just a little bit about the role of the Florida Bankers Association. We, you know, uh, in, uh, you know, our primary role is to advocate uh, two things, one for the industry and for a strong economy. Uh, and so we we meet with regulators, we meet with uh, members of our parliament or Congress to advocate why they should support uh, proposals, legislative proposals to allow our bankers to better serve the communities and, and customers they serve. And that's important because, uh, you know, policymakers don't always understand what impact uh, a, a law or regulatory uh, uh, item might have uh, and, and taking banks away from the ultimate goal of serving customers and enhancing their economic vitality, because that's what the banking industry does. Where, where supermarkets ha are in the business of selling food, banks are in the business of lending money to help people fulfill their dreams. Right, absolutely. I love that idea of bankers make dreams come true because in marketing terms, it's it's not actually the the uh, the immediate product is what it achieves for them afterwards. You talked in there about advocating for uh, for the industry and also arguing for a strong economy. Um, and I know that you've uh, been on the advisory board of uh, Exim Bank uh, yes. in in Washington, and you've told me that you travel to to Washington. Um, I presume in a lobbying capacity. In in the USA, what's the uh, the role of regulation of banker behavior? Because it would be nice to believe that everywhere around the world, bankers would behave in the best interest of their end customers. Um, but uh, of course, from time to time, it requires regulation and, and, and a, a fairly strong arm of regulation. How is it there with you? Is it different in Florida? Are there specific Florida regulations or are they all for the whole of the states? They're, they're basically, uh, you know, Florida does have, you know, some different uh, regulations than other states, but generally speaking, Stephen, it comes from Washington. So it's all applied to all the 50 states of the United States. But you're absolutely right. Look, this is a regulated industry and it should be. It should be regulated. The The money of, of the people are deposited in our banks. And, uh, well, you know, so it needs to be regulated. The, the question is, is there a tipping point where it's too much regulation, where bankers then are hiring more lawyers and more compliance staff than lenders, uh, which is what the business of banks is? Uh, I, I will point out, Stephen, that I, I'm envious and I've always been a big fan of the Chartered Bankers Institute uh, in, in the UK. And I know there are many, many countries around the world because, you know, it sets the tone. It sets it allows the public to know that you're dealing with a chartered banker. And what does that mean? That means that someone who has been educated continues to receive education and training uh, to be on the cutting edge. Uh, of of the latest uh, proposals, laws, regulations, and ethical standards. So I think that is so, so important. I wish we had that here in the United States, but I, I, I see that as a very important uh, a public policy issue uh, by the Chartered Bankers Institute. And I know many of, of the countries represented uh, on this call uh, are part of that. And I, I think that's important. I really, really do. Great. Well, of course, that's a that's a that enthusiastic endorsement, uh, which wasn't actually pre-prepared. Everybody should know. You know, we haven't we haven't practiced this, uh, but is is great because uh, as most of the people in this uh, webinar today will know, although some of them may be guests who are thinking about joining our program, the Chartered Banker MBA, leading to Chartered Banker status. The, the, the CBI, Chartered Banker Institute, is our partner, our professional partner here. And um, Alex uh, has some links uh, directly with, uh, with CBI as well. What would you say, Alex, are some of the desirable attributes or skills or behaviors? Because as you say, there's regulation and there's a tipping point too much regulation and it's uh, all about lawyers, you, your previous uh, profession uh, solely, of course. Uh, so um, I won't we won't use the phrase of uh, of a poacher termed gamekeeper or whatever the phrase is that uh, uh, that's used in, in, in English. Um, what about some of the skills? Can 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 customers just rely solely 
on banks being regulated or is there that we need innovation how do we how do we get responsible behavior what kind of skills and behaviors do we want in our bank because globally not just in right. the us not just in in the uk and wales well, you know, a uh, great question, Stephen. Look, uh, number one for all the bankers uh, and and uh, on this on this briefing, uh, look, uh, you're the trusted advisor uh, to your customers. Now, some of you may not have direct contact uh, with customers, and 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 that's okay. But you're supporting those at your bank that do, and and you're probably called on whether you're in compliance whether you're in marketing, wh whatever part of the bank you're in, you're fulfilling the mission to help those that are serving customers uh, be the trusted advisor. And that's important because customers are depending on our bankers for advice. Hey, should I buy this home? Should I, uh, you know, based on my income, do I qualify for this mortgage? Uh, should I take on this mortgage, which is uh, a house that's priced higher than I budgeted for? Uh, what do you think? What's your advice? And that's so important when our bankers advise clients, uh, look, do this, do that. in uh, and, and wealth management too. You know, you you worked all your life. You're you're now 59 years old. You're thinking about your nest egg for retirement. You're looking for a banker, which is what I always recommend to the public. Go to a banker, someone who has reputation risk. Uh, if you go to John Doe, financial advisor. Who's John Doe? What if he advises you wrong? What if you go to his uh, shop the next day? He may be closed, not at a bank. A bank has reputation risk. They're going to more likely than not be around. Uh, and so you are the trusted advisor. And, and whether it's regulation or not, you don't need regulation to be that. You you need it needs to come internally to fulfill that role to help your clients fulfill their dreams for them, themselves and their families. That's right. I mean, I think the point you, you've used there about uh, having a relationship with an organization that has its own reputation at risk, and therefore uh, they ought to behave in a, a manner that's beneficial to you, the customer, uh, to themselves as your trusted advisor. Um, and the, the challenge for us in the financial services industry around the world is to get, as you say, get it so that these values are internal yeah, to the right. person, not just because they look at a list of regulations and go 2.4 says I mustn't do that. And right. it's about how we how we get people to absorb those particular um, uh, those particular skills in the news yesterday. I think it was or the day before, certainly this week, uh, it was reported that uh, it's only one example, um, and it's an allegation that Credit Suisse, the very large uh, Swiss-based bank, of course, and as a country, Switzerland uh, prides itself on its professionalism in banking, uh, was under investigation by uh, the European Parliament, one of the political groupings there, with a view to alleged money laundering. The thing right. about reputation, as you say, of course, uh, Alex, is it's hard to win it, but very quick potentially to lose it. Exactly, Stephen. Look, and, and and in a nanosecond, you worked all your life, you, you've got a great reputation, and, and that's when you have ethical violations. You're absolutely right, Stephen. You can lose that in a nanosecond. And so you got to do the right thing. And, uh, you know, we have global, you know, uh, anti-money laundering laws, and, uh, and, and, and you can't sweep it under the rug. I mean, if you, you, you know, I, I think uh, uh, whether it's law enforcement or a bank or whomever, if, if you're helping someone hide money uh, and, and it's not ethical, it's not legal, it's not morally correct, you you know it as the banker, you know it and you've got to report that uh, because, you know, it's it, it just you can lose that reputation so quickly. So uh, personally and uh, institutionally, uh, and, uh, you know, Switzerland is always, as you said, prided itself on being a, a country where, you know, uh, you know, there were no rules uh, uh, or the rules were different there. Well, you know, every dog has his day, Stephen, and and uh, they're having it now. And that institution is is in that country and their privacy laws are in deep, deep, serious question. 
Yes, unfortunately uh, they are, and nobody takes any pleasure from it, I'm sure, because there, there, but for the grace of God, uh, go, go I. If I don't pay attention, or if my institution doesn't behave in uh, in in a professional manner, um, I'm going to ask uh, Dan, Danny, if he can just share in place of my picture, which is rather boring, and of course, as many people will say, is Bangor really that that like that with palm trees and blue sky? And the answer <laughs> is, of course, it is. But Danny, can you just share? <laughs> The, the image of uh, that I sent of the United Nations um, slide about banking, responsible banking. Here we go, testing our technology. And OK, there it is. OK, and uh, the principles for responsible banking that the font is a little small in size. Uh, it talks about customers and clients and it talks about these six principles there at the bottom is transparency and accountability and uh, the aspect the variety of stakeholders i wanted to uh, ask you a little bit about the um, yes. the central column the central column talks about impact and target setting and then at the bottom it talks about how governance in uh, and regulation but also culture uh, and I wanted to ask you, is there a tension uh, in your experience, your opinion between target setting for people to achieve certain targets for uh, their organization, for their own remuneration and perhaps career development and the culture that we set in an organization? Because you've been talking about reputational risk. We need personal and institutional uh, ethical behavior. You know, you know, uh, look, um, there's many ways to look at this, but this is how, this is my answer to this question, Stephen. Look, if you're advising your client, you, your client is paramount. Uh, again, within all legal, moral, and ethical uh, boundaries. So as long as you stay in those boundaries uh, and you've got to advise your client about, uh, you know, the purchase of this property or uh, their tax uh, scenario, uh, and tax laws in every country are very complicated. Uh, I see nothing wrong if, if you have a client and in whatever country you're living in and there's a deduction of, of, of for their taxes to lower their tax, uh, you know, uh, responsibility and burden. If if that if your country's parliament passed that and that became the law, there's nothing wrong with advising your client. Hey, look, don't forget to take this deduction uh, for this expense that you had last year. That lowers your tax burden for the coming year. There's nothing wrong with that. You are within all legal and ethical bounds because you need to advise your client on what is best for him or her. Uh, so I I think there there is no uh, a clash of those two and advising your uh, and then the governance and culture uh, boundaries. As long as you stay within those bounds, uh, you know, I use taxes as a example, Stephen, because it's always complicated. It's always, you know, taxes everywhere. Uh, you know, there, and then there's a million exemptions to the rules and, and it's just being smart enough to find those as a trusted advisor that bankers play in the role that they play. That's what you need to do. Advise your client as to what's best for him or her. So I, I don't see any conflicts at all as long as you stay within the legal and ethical uh, bounds uh, of, of the regulations and laws of your country. OK, great. I want to pick up on something that's on the Florida Banker Association's homepage. You can see I've done some homework and uh -huh. uh, uh, I had it in case I need to use it. And it talks about um, the bank and the individuals that make up today's Florida Bank as Association and by extension all uh, banks and uh, the Chartered Banker Institute etc have learned from the past and are committed to making the future brighter uh, and of course that that goes back to um, bankers making dreams come true for their customers being trusted advisors etc. I wanted to ask you in terms of um, preparing people for careers in financial services, wherever they are in the world, the um, the idea as to whether or not it's a one time uh, set of education uh, or, or the principles and the ideas, which perhaps uh, I'm sure the Florida Bankers Association, as we do here and with the CBI, uh, talks about lifelong learning. 
I, you know, Stephen, look, uh, to, to all the students on this call, look, uh, my advice on your careers is this. One, uh, kudos to you for being at Bangor University uh, and getting your, your executive uh, MBA. Uh, that, that's a testament e either to yourself or to those uh, at your bank who believe in you and ask you to attend this great program. And, and continue to do that. Learn all that you can as you rise in your career. And uh, so always, always, anytime you have a chance to, to, to uh, receive training, whether it's a formalized training like Bangor University or other training, sign up. Don't, don't let that pass. Uh, that's number one. Number two, and this may go beyond your questions even, but to, for success, this is what I recommend to all uh, all the attendees on this call. Volunteer, I... volunteer, Stephen. If the nice CEO thing. or senior management at your bank says, I need someone to do this or to uh, move to this market to open up a brand new uh, office for us, who in the group would like to volunteer to do that? Raise your hand. Raise your hand and volunteer because People like that, and uh, and and don't be afraid to rise. You know, uh, you know. Obviously, don't don't uh, step on anyone uh, as you go up the ladder because you never know when you're going to need people if you go down the ladder uh, of life. So, uh, you know, rise to your marriage without making anybody else look bad. Obviously, but don't be afraid of that. Uh, because that you know it, it, it's 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 okay to be promoted. It's okay to have a a vision for your career. It's okay for you to dream about being the CEO. There's nothing wrong with that. And and you preparing yourself, uh, whether you know. And there's there's a couple of tracks in banking. Uh, if you're a lender at a bank, you have a very good chance of one day being in senior management because. Uh, bankers that know how to lend money are usually the ones who become the CEOs uh, or the executive vice presidents or whatever the title is in your respective country. Uh, those in the financial part of a bank uh, can rise to be the chief financial officer or the comptroller of the bank. And, and, and again, you know, you know, dedicate yourself to this industry as you are because it's a, it's a noble one. And then the last uh, a category that I can think of is the compliance area, a very important area in our industry now. Perhaps it wasn't 20 years ago, but if you're in compliance, uh, imagine being the chief risk officer of a bank or the chief compliance officer, because you know the regulations and you know how to uh, navigate a bank through the uh, minefields of the regulatory uh, laws and regulations in your particular country. So. Uh, you know, but volunteer, volunteer and get training. Those are essential items uh, for your progress uh, at your institutions or other institutions. Yes, indeed. And um, you, you correctly uh, characterize compliance as a, as a growing uh, aspect of financial services and a minefield because uh, for every example that comes up, that uh, a legal uh, jurisdiction, wherever it is in the world, uh, prosecutes, then new sets of guidelines come out. And, and that's an example of the need to have lifelong learning to be picking these things up as, as we go along. Uh, I'm just going to uh, ask Danny to share one more slide and then uh, Alex uh, and I will, will conclude and see what the questions look like. So, uh, well, Danny's ahead of me there. He's got a slide up called the responsible banker. Um, in as much as there were only two slides, when I said the next slide, it was going to be that one. But thanks, Danny. Here we are. This is from the um, Chartered Banker Institute, uh, the professional partner of our um, MBA, the Chartered Banker MBA, and mentioned in glowing terms uh, by Alex a little earlier. They talk about the responsible banker, the banker who uh, is aware of technology and digital aspects and hasn't that come to the fore during the COVID-19 situation when people couldn't physically get to banks and things or to stores in general. The ethical banker as uh, Alex has been emphasising, the uh, sustainable banker uh, and I just wanted to touch on, on two of those aspects Alex and ask you uh, for your thoughts on sustainable banking of course is a very hot topic at the moment 
that uh, is an increasing emphasis in our chartered banker MBA. Sustainable banking uh, may be thought to be just about the green environment, but of course it, it's, it's much more than that. And um, I was reading an article recently that talked about the idea of a reputational risk that you referred to earlier, Alex. Organizations are at risk, banks, financial lenders uh, are at risk. If I lend money to company B, even if I am completely ethical and in compliance with the regulations in the part of the transaction that I do, if that organization then goes out into the wider world as part of its everyday operations, the organization, the, the, the party that borrowed the money and damages the environment, does something unethical, there is by extension a little bit of mud that sticks to me as the person who lent to them or the institution. And then the future bank, uh, the future banker picking up on those United Nations finance principles for responsible banking. You're right, it's a complicated world, as you said, and a minefield. Any thoughts on sustainable banking? Yes, you know, Stephen, this is where, uh, and this is an issue that we're addressing in the United States now. Uh, and, and, and for our global systemic risk banks, the top 50 in the world, I believe they play in a different sandbox on that issue. Uh, but but generally speaking, let me let me address it as an industry. Look, I think uh, bankers, yes, we we have uh, a, a major role in society. Uh, we're the ones who make the economy go. Uh, I will be in Tunisia, Stephen, uh, in May, uh, as they establish a, uh, a credit bureau in their country, and we're going to help the bankers there uh, uh, in the implementation of the of the uh, of the credit bureau, because you know they haven't had it before, where they can see the FICO scoring of each customer to see what risk they have, whether they should be lend money or not. Because remember, at the end of the day, we're so well regulated that you know you have to make a loan that can be repaid. Otherwise, the capital of the bank decreases, and that's where the banks generally get in trouble. But look. On the sustainable banker issue, on the future banker, on the digital banker, ethical banker, uh, yes, you have a major role in society to play. And I would encourage all the bankers on this call to, to get involved in their communities. Uh, uh, you know, join one or two uh, charitable uh, non-for-profit organizations and get involved. Give back uh, to your community. Uh, and, and whether it's a hospital board or whether it's some other non-for-profit organization to help those who are less fortunate. I think bankers do a great job of giving back. Uh, on the sustainable banker, your specific question on the environment, this is where I differ with many uh, uh, that you know want our bankers to be the climate police. Uh, I urge our, our government in the United States, if you have a problem if you want to change the laws on the on those industries that depend on the fossil fuels, pass a law, make it illegal to bank the fossil fuel industry. The banker should not be put in the in in the position of being the climate police. That's not your role. That's not the role of our industry. The banker should be the one making the risk management decisions of whether to A, bank someone, or B, not bank that one. The government shouldn't tell them, yes, bank them, no, do not bank them. Uh, and if the if the government wants to make fossil fuels and, and those industries that depend on fossil fuels illegal, they should pass a law on that. That should not be placed on the shoulders of our industry because we're not the climate police. And then we have to hire incredible compliance staff that, Quite frankly, some of our medium-sized banks uh, m and smaller banks may not be able to afford that. Our larger worldwide global top 50 banks, yes, they probably can't afford it, but other members in our industry cannot. So that is you know, my position on that. But I do think the bankers have a role to play. And it starts right there in your local community where you reside. You got to give back. You got to be an ethical banker, uh, and 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 you know, and and you obviously digitally you got to understand because for many this is becoming more and more 
the bank branch, this little uh, smartphone where you do all your banking services. So uh, there's a lot of responsibilities on our bankers' shoulders right now, uh, but one that I do not want to add to the list of responsibility, Stephen, is for our bankers to be the climate police, because I don't think that's our role. OK, I think that's very clear, and many people would agree, as you said earlier, you want uh, uh, you want uh, compliance, then uh, uh, pass the regulations, the laws. I'm uh, minded of a song by Joni Mitchell. Uh, maybe not all the delegates in the uh, in, in the webinar heard um, Alex and I talking beforehand, uh, but we Alex is a big fan of the Beatles um, and um, I was using a song by Joni Mitchell a couple of lectures ago. Uh, which I will <coughs> briefly sing, that says they paved paradise and put up a parking lot. And of course, that's an anthem about environmentalism. And it led to, as a response, not solely, um, uh, not solely Joni Mitchell, but it led to new regulations in the States, uh, also about um, uh, handling uh, pollution and all sorts of things. So, yeah, I think I, I'd agree that... Uh, past the regulations and uh, the compliance area that we've said is uh, growing in global financial services uh, will ensure that the um, their organization works through it. Well, everybody, it's 14.38 UK time, and that means that uh, I'll ask Alex in a moment if he has a specific anything specific in addition he wants to say, but building on that link from the um, Beatles, uh, the Beatles song goes, it's been a hard day's night and we're going to move from the hard day's night, not of listening to Alex, but of, of coming out through COVID and hopefully coming into uh, the uplands as uh, regulations ease. And uh, Alex, any final point you want to make before I open it up to some questions? Yeah, yeah I do, Stephen, I do. And here's my advice uh, from working with bankers uh, for many, many years that uh, because globally this happens everywhere and so uh, uh you know this is a relationship business uh yes you know digitally you got to be ready uh and but at the end of the day relationship banking is important uh, in fulfilling your customers needs but for you the individual banker relationships also matter so our industry has been and will continue to have a lot of mergers and acquisitions activities. And it's no fun going through an M&A at your bank because it, 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 your, the tensions go up, uh, you, the stress levels go up, you got two banks merging together, who's going to stay as the director of marketing, who will stay as the chief compliance officer, will it be you or her uh, as the two banks merge? So, uh, you know, these are the stressful things that happen and, and they're going to continue happening in our industry, no matter where you live in our world. So what's the solution to this? Make sure you have relationships in our industry with and have as many friends as possible. It's important, uh, you know, I, I, you know, giving back, give back to our industry, give back to the industry that provides for your livelihood. Meet with other bankers from other banks. Uh, you know, because that's how that network that you create will serve you well. Now I'm talking about you individually, uh, not as an industry, in case there's an M&A at your bank and in case, you know, you're, you're, you lose the battle as to who's going to be the, uh, the person employed after the merger takes place. Uh, and, and you better have a Rolodex where you can dial up people and say, hey, uh, look, uh, is there a position at, at your bank? And, and having those relationships will serve you well for your career. So that, that's my, uh, you know, because M&As are going to continue to have it happen as our, in, in, as our banks consolidate. Uh, and I think that's sometimes bankers forget that, you know, you, you obviously take care of the home front of your family but also give back to your community. It's a lot on bankers' shoulders. It's a lot, personally. Uh, but, you know, take care of your family, give back to your community, but also network so that you will have the support team personally and individually in case you need to have it uh, because our, our industry continues to merge. And, uh, and obviously, when that happens, there's some downshifting that occurs 
in our employee base of our banks. Yes, indeed. Thanks for that. And uh, just in the responsible banker slide from the CBI, it said uh, continuing professional development. We've talked about that and, and perhaps we can coin a new phrase if it doesn't already exist based on Alex's contribution about uh, continuing professional relationships. Yeah, because you never know what's going to happen. Of course, the role of uh, being able to speak to others in your industry, uh, which is an important thing for the Florida Bankers Association, uh, but is also something that Bangor University wants to do through its alumni on this program to facilitate that, that uh, exchange and interaction. Let me go to the questions and ask a question. Um, I'll pose it on behalf of Aaron Osborne Taylor, who asks the question, can non-specialists, can non-specialists uh, gain access to senior banking roles? You know, I, I, yes, they can. I mean, but at, at the end of the day, uh, you know, you know, whatever you do, uh, you know, <clears throat> And whatever you do, whatever your role is, do it the best possible ways. And you'll be, it, it, you know, as a CEO, I will tell you, you notice that. You notice that, uh, you know, we have people on our team that have more general, uh, non-specific roles, but you notice the job they're doing. So whatever role you have, do it the best possible uh, way. So that will make you stand out as an excellent team member of whatever bank you or organization you are currently in, uh, but having said that, uh, if by training, by training at Bangor University and other places in in back in your respective countries, you know if, if you can specialize and learn more about a specific area or two, that's not a bad idea either. Uh, again, whether it's financial, whether it's compliance. Or, or whether it's in lending, uh, and and those those are the three primary areas that I think uh, 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 you know any bank executive uh, worth their weight, uh, it, it, you know, in success will will have a good handle on. And so, uh, you know, it's not a bad, uh, air, you know, it's good to be a generalist, uh, but it's also good to learn some specific areas uh, within a bank as well. OK, thanks for that. And uh, just a, a general invitation to people in the call, uh, put your questions into uh, the chat area uh, so I can read them and, and, and sift through them and praise through them. Uh, but also, as in a moment, I will ask Claire uh, for her question. You can put your hand up uh, just before I go to Claire. Um, the idea of giving back to your industry, to society at large. Uh, I often say to our graduates from the Chartered Banker MBA program, and what are you going to do with all this time now that you've got that you used wow. to do for studying? And some of them go, I'm going to go studying further. Well, that's excellent as well. And some of them go, I need a rest. And I say, don't forget your family and friends, but also don't forget what else you could do with that time. The kind of things you've been saying, Alex, about yes. giving back uh, through charitable work or whatever. Now, in the uh, discussion and it's before- it's good for business. It's good for business too, Stephen. It's good for business. When you're involved in the community and you're the uh, volunteer head of the local chamber of commerce, or uh, you know the uh, you're on the hospital board, you're or you you help disadvantaged children. People notice that, and people like to do business with people they like and know. That's yeah, a general think, rule that applies anywhere and everywhere. Yeah, and I think of course that's not just restricted to to financial services. Um, before the uh, webinar kicked off. Claire uh, made the very brave claim, which I'm sure is substantiated, that she is related <laughs> somehow to uh, a, be uh, 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 a Beatles member. Claire, if this is a question about the Beatles, uh, this is not the venue, but go ahead and ask your question, Claire. Oh, OK, it's not about the Beatles. Um, I'm a human resource management academic, Alex, um, but yes. I could miss the opportunity for coming in and listening to what has been a really interesting um, presentation. So I'm really glad that I kind of hopped in <laughs> um, to this presentation. Um, just from my perspective, an area of interest for me is recruitment and changes in the type of employee um, that are recruited. And I read some research recently that said that, you know, over um, half of millennials um, have some form of crypto investment. And I just wondered, um, is this 
sort of driving change in the type of employee or skill set that you are interested in as an industry in recruiting? You know, you know, Claire, I, crypto is one of those great uh, cocktail reception topics. It, it, it just uh, it, it gets people's attention. But, the, you know, and you've seen the ups and downs. If you ask Elon Musk when he uh, you know, got out of crypto right in the nick of time before 40 percent market value uh, decline, you know, uh, crypto is one of these topics that until the I'll use the UK and the US, but really all countries until a certain form of cryptocurrency is blessed by the UK, US and other countries, it, it's just a lot of good chatter because because of the anti-money laundering laws uh, and the Bank Secrecy Act, governments want to know where is the money going and who's getting it. And they will never allow the transfer of any type of currency, whether it's crypto or real, to be sent from London to uh, you know, uh, Santiago, Chile, without knowing who is the sender and who is the, the recipient of these funds. And, and right now, currently in the crypto world, the governments don't know that. So, and it's more difficult to know. So, uh, yes, we've got to monitor, uh, you know, the crypto issue. But as it relates to the millennials, uh, you know, look, millennials have other needs that outweigh the, their knowledge and like for crypto. One, uh, you know, they like the working remotely uh, issue, at least part of the time. They understand it's not good for millennials to be home all day, uh, because then if you're not seen at the office by those who supervise you, you know, your chances of moving up in, in management ranks is reduced. So that, you know, but yes, they are interested in more free time. They're interested in more uh, perhaps, like I mentioned, remote working, maybe a day or two a week. So if you're trying to recruit a millennial into your bank, uh, that's one of the promises that you can make to them that I think they'll like very much. They also like banks who give socially back. So a bank or any corporation, I have found that here in, in the United States, when millennials are interviewed, their questions are, what is the bank's social policy in, in giving back to the community? They like to be involved in that. Uh, yes, they're interested in money, just like all of us are, but they're also interested in making sure that the banks are fulfilling as a uh, corporate citizen uh, their role in giving back to those perhaps that are less fortunate or more needy. So there's many other, you know, but the 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 free time issue is a big issue for millennials. They want that, even at the expense of of salary sometimes, at least until they get older, Claire, is what I have found here uh, in the United States in our marketplace. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alex. Does that help? Does that yeah, help? Yeah, absolutely, Claire? absolutely. It's really good to have your perspective on it. I think the the um, the impact of uh, uh, COVID will be interesting. I was reading just before we came online um, about uh, a company here, which um, is effectively a share trading company. I can mention the name. It's in the public domain. It's called Hargreaves Lansdowne. And uh, the share price has uh, fallen dramatically because it's now realized that uh, Many of those people who during COVID working from home, filling their time with different things, were making investments of various kinds through the platform set up by Hargreaves Land Sound. People as they return to work in more conventional ways uh, have less time to do that. It's expected there'll be less commission earned by um, by Hargreaves Land Sound. Share price falls. You know, it's a uh, it's a wide ranging impact we're going to see for a long time. Now, here's a question. Go on, yeah, go can I just say this? You know, Stephen, look, as far as working from home, this is what I tell, uh, you know, uh, uh, our folks here in the United States when I talk to uh, the teams at, uh, at different banks. Look, you know, working from home is not all it's cut out to be. I, I think we as human beings miss the interaction of seeing each other. Uh, let me walk down the hallway to discuss this deal with Mary and, and get Mary's thoughts. Uh, you know, I, I think that that is priceless. And I think that's is missing. 
in, in addition to, you know, hey, 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 Joe, Mary and, and uh, Bill, let's have lunch today uh, to discuss this issue or discuss this deal. Uh, and, and, you know, you can't do that through a Zoom call or Microsoft Teams call. You got to do that in person. And I think it's more valuable to do it if there's no, any, no other way but through a Zoom call or a Microsoft Teams call. Then you have to do it that way. But I think, uh, you know, and then you're at home. You, you're missing the human interaction. I think we need that. I think that's part of our DNA. Uh, so, but anyway, Stephen, I just wanted to add that. Next question, please. Yes, I think that's right. And um, uh, of course, uh, I have found since we have gone in what we call in Bangor University to uh, dynamic working, that it's actually been a pleasure to meet some colleagues who I haven't seen, who I never expected it would be such a pleasure. They're not in this meeting, so we're quite safe, <laughs> and I shan't <laughs> mention their name. Uh, there's a question here uh, from uh, Gilbert, Gilbert Barike, who asks about, uh, could you say a little bit about how um, ESG, environmental, social and governance, uh, is the hot topic relates to banking fraternity? And he particularly says, in the future, ESG and the future of banking is Gilbert's question. Now, remind me, what is ESG? Let ESG, me... environmental, social and governance uh, criteria in terms what? of uh, uh, how how uh, we manage investments and things and how companies are performing. Should I invest in somebody who has uh, excellent returns but is uh, completely uh, um, poorly performing with regard to the green environment, uh, the social aspects for society as a whole? You know, uh, look, excellent question. And again, uh, you have a fiduciary, you know, fiduciary obligation is is very important in our industry uh, and other professions as well. Uh, but again, your fiduciary obligation, you're not the social police, you're not the climate police, you're, not, you're you know, we need to depend on our governments uh, and our governments can't kick the can to our, the banking industry to put us in a position to be any of the above. I mean, if if our go respective governments uh, that are represented on this call want to pass a different policy, they should. But they shouldn't put that on the backs of bankers. Uh, and again, you know, there's a big debate here in the United States now. Uh, you know, look, we all want a clean, safe environment. Of course we do. Look at Florida, how beautiful it is. And we want to keep it that way. But but should our bankers be telling, you know, their customers, hey, don't invest here because it's not green or <coughs> I will not lend you money because you're not a green company. I don't think that's our role. Now, you know, do we want polluters and all that? No, of course not. But uh, as long as it's a legal company and a legal industry, I think our bankers have to use that at the end of the day as the barometer and the ultimate test on whether they should deal with that customer. It, I, I, obviously, if, if an industry or, or, or profession is not legal, we're not gonna bank them. We're not gonna bank them, we're not gonna lend them money, we're not gonna advise them in any way, shape or form, but to put that on the shoulders of bankers is a cop-out and a kicking the can away from our respective governments. A very clear statement there, which uh, uh, Alex uh, probably explains why um, uh, I won't say you're popular. Well, you're po you'll be popular with some politicians when you go to Washington. Now, um, Alex, everyone kindly offered to extend his time yes. beyond yes. the one hour. And I've just seen, Danny, that on my screen, at least it's popped up that our, uh, our link um, will terminate. Uh, it'll be about four minutes now. Are we able to extend that, uh, Danny? Yeah, it's not going to end. It's just uh, just to say that the hour is coming to a, to a close. But it's, the, record, the recording will continue for those who aren't here. It will. Yeah, it will. Good, thank you. OK, now there's another hand up. Um, uh, it's a bit like a classroom, hands up in the classroom. Uh, uh -huh. And Matt Allen, uh, another academic colleague from the business school, has a question. Go ahead, Matt. Yeah, many thanks, Stephen. And many thanks, Alex, for your presentation and your answers that you've given so far. I've really enjoyed listening to what you've had to say. Um, a sort of teach strategy. So I wondered if you could say a little bit more about what's driving the mergers in the banking industry and also if, you, if there are any other tips that you might have for people who work in the industry in addition to you know, making sure that they maintain and extend their networks, um, you know, what, what other skills they might be 
thinking about acquiring or what might be good for them to acquire if there are quite a few sort of mergers, acquisitions going on within the industry? You know, Mac, excellent question. Uh, and, and and this is one that this is one you don't learn uh, in, in school. I mean, uh, there, there's so many subjects that, uh, you know, Stephen and, and his colleagues are trying to infuse onto you. Uh, and, and, and this is one that, you know, uh, in the school of hard knocks, uh, you learn uh, if you've been to a mergers and acquisition and and you were the one left out out on the street. You realize that it does take a village. Uh, you know, you, you no man, no woman uh, is an island to themselves. You've got to have relationships in this world. Uh, so I would encourage you to get involved in groups like the Florida Bankers Association. Uh, you know, whether it's the British Bankers Association, whether it's the alumni, this class, this class staying in touch together. Uh, I'm helping a student now uh, who's a Bangor University graduate in our industry to, to get a job uh, uh, somewhere else within his bank. Uh, and I'm using my contacts here in the United States to help him because he has stayed in touch with me. Uh, you know, uh, we had a student uh, 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 who, who lives in Liverpool. Now he's practicing law. He was a law graduate. He spent uh, a week with me in Washington and I invited him because we stayed in contact and, and I you know, took him to our Congress and he met many of our members of parliament. So, you know, staying in touch with people is number one and reaching out, you know, meeting colleagues. And usually these are uh, at, you know, uh, you know, I've worked with the Tanzanian Bankers Association, the Kenyan Bankers Association the Rwandan Bankers Association, you know, and, and they have meetings and I would encourage you to get involved there. And that's where you meet people in your own profession. Uh, if, if you're not a banker and then in other areas and other professional groups. Uh, so that's important as why do we continue to have M&As in our industry? Well, because banks always have the dilemma, how do I increase my footprint and market share in a marketplace? They have two ways of doing it. De novo branching of just opening up new branches uh, in, a, in a community or buying someone else and getting that footprint instantaneously by buying someone else. And the latter is usually how most banks choose to do it, uh, even though that's a very expensive way of doing it. So uh, just, just stay in touch with uh, people. Uh, M&As are gonna happen. They will continue to happen. And, and it's personally rewarding too. You create new friendships uh, and, uh, and, and, a, and a broader social network. Uh, that, and, and by the way, it's not just for you to get help, it's also for you to help others as well. Uh, and you may be the one aiding others. So that's a good thing too. Thanks, Alex. There's a couple of questions come up. One of them yeah. from Hedillion says, uh, with respect to entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs seeking capital to fund their projects in your own view uh, is it uh, more feasible to approach uh, sources uh, other than banks uh, due to the strict criteria required by banks in general for funding you know great question and imagine bill gates the founder of microsoft along with some of his uh, friends in his parents uh uh car garage uh, back, you know, 40 plus years ago. Uh, imagine if he went to get a loan at a bank and said, and they asked, Mr. Gates, you're, you just dropped out of Harvard University. You're, you're 20 years old, and this is software that you're creating? Uh, now, is, is that soft? Do I wear that softly? Is that what this is? And he, and he said, no, 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 no. This is the brains that goes into a computer that makes it operate. That's what I'm working on in my parents' garage, and I need a hundred thousand dollar loan. Uh, you know, uh, so sometimes it's difficult for bankers to put this in a box. Uh, but you got to believe. Uh, look, one of the most richest uh, persons in the world uh, is the owner of the Jacksonville. Uh, Jaguars, which is a National Football League team here in our city of Jacksonville, Florida, Mr. Shakan. Mr. Shakan was an engineering student from Pakistan at the University of Illinois uh, in, um, 
in, in, in the state of Illinois here in, in our state. So he went into Busey Bank. And I know this because I have lunch with the board of directors at Busey Bank in Champaign, Illinois, and they they continue their friendship with Mr. Shakan, uh, who's, again, one of the wealthiest people in the world uh, here and, uh, and, and, and globally. Uh, and he went in, Stephen, uh, to ask for a loan because he had an idea for a car park. So here's an engineering student from Pakistan walking into a locally owned community bank in Champaign, Illinois. And guess what? They gave him the loan because they believed in him and they believed in his his idea. And that's what I would encourage all bankers to keep an open mind. Mr. Shakan still keeps accounts there. Now he's got banks, monies in global banks around the world and he's, you know, melted, mega wealthy. But he still believes in that bank and visits that bank occasionally because that's who gave him his start. They believed in him. So believe in your customers. Get to know them. Get to know their ideas. Think out of the box. But yes, it is difficult in our industry because we're well regulated. And the and at the end of the day, your examiners are going to go into your bank and look at your loan portfolios and say, why did you make this loan? And you got to explain that. So, but keep an open mind. Great question, though. Great question. And I, I think a great example that you gave of this, uh, of Mr. Shakan, who goes as an engineering student in Pakistan, and somebody there could see merit uh, beyond just doing the numbers. So it wasn't solely managing by the numbers. Um, there's a question uh, that um, builds on something that you said. You waved your mobile phone, I'll wave mine. It's not a competition, but. Um, we, we talk about digital banking and um, of course, in many of the things that we use our phones for, we have um, friends and we've got many, you know, I've got many followers and friends. No, actually, you haven't got that many friends. They're, they're, they're just acquaintances. And the question from Mohammed Adalabu is, uh, could you say a little bit more about digital banking and how this is going to impact, particularly with regard to relationships? You have quite rightly uh, emphasized Alex and it's one of the things I talk about in the marketing strategy module the benefit of a relationship for both parties uh, is that going to be as easy to achieve without face-to-face -face interaction is it going to be easy as easy to achieve using uh, mobile technologies do you think you know it, look it, it, you got to do both you got to do the click and the brick as they say you got to have brick you got to have a branch you got to have an office to show people, look, you've got a problem, you can come see me. But yes, more and more, you know, even me, I use this, I transfer money within my accounts without even going to the bank. You can take, take a photograph of the check and deposit it, uh, and you don't even have to go to the bank. It's amazing what can be done with this smartphone. But I will say this, if I have a problem, and guess what I'm going to do? I'm not going to get on this. It's my money. It's my hard earned money. And I'm going to go to the bank and say, what is going on here? Let's fix this thing. And and so you, you know, you, you I know who my personal banker is. I called them yesterday. My bank just merged and I was having problem getting online. I called him. I didn't go see him, but I was thinking about it. And I called him. And I said, fix it. I need you to fix it, and and so I know his cell number, I know his office number, and uh, and he fixed it for me because I I didn't have access to my accounts online. But that's just one example. So yes, online is important. It's great, but I, it, it, and then if I'm a business owner and I have an issue, you think I'm going to care about getting online? No, I need answers, and I need answers now. Uh, and 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 if I have a business loan with your bank, I have a lot at stake. Uh, I, I don't want somebody to tell me, get online and fix it. No, you better come see me or I'll see you and I need answers then and now. So relationship banking will continue to be vital in our industry. Yes, but do both. This is also important too. Great. That uh, is perhaps an unintentional link into the next question, Alex, how these things come up fortuitously. Maggie McGeary asks, um, as mergers and acquisitions continue. Uh, how do you see the future of digital banking with particular regard to artificial intelligence? Artificial intelligence. And how is that innovative? Yeah, uh, it's been increasingly 
uh, a form of competition being considered by mainstream banks. What will that do to relationships? You know, you won't be able to phone up in perhaps quite the same way. Or will there always be a role, even if you can't see them face to face, for a relationship manager? You know, I, I think that uh, there's limits to everything, depending on what your needs are. If you're just a vanilla, uh, uh, if your needs are vanilla, plain old vanilla, sure, you can get online and, and open up a checking account, a savings account. Uh, but but again, you know, uh, you know, that's nice. But, but banks are not going to make any money on those customers. Where do banks make money? Just like the supermarket in the in the United Kingdom, Tesco. How do they make money? Well, if they don't sell food, they don't eat. They don't make any money. How do bankers make money? By having deposit accounts and savings account? That just offers banks liquidity to, to do the ultimate transaction that a bank wants to do. And what is that? Make loans. Make loans to you and I, charging us an interest rate. That's how banks have made money. And now through wealth management services, through brokerage services and other type things. But at the end of the day, most banks make their money by lending money. So digitally, you know, yeah, they'll make some loans, but, and 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 do you really want to get a loan? If you're buying your first home, do you really want to do it just digitally? Don't you want to sit down with a trusted advisor and go over your finances and say, look, I make, uh, you know, $100,000 a year, uh, and I and and after taxes, my my salary is X. Can I afford a monthly payment on this home that my spouse and I want to buy? Those are things you got to sit in person and get feedback and have a conversation. It just can't be just get online or have a chat uh, on the chat line uh, on the digital bank space. Uh, you know, I, there'll be some people who are satisfied with that, but with the biggest investment in your life, whether it's starting a business or buying a home, I suggest to you as bankers, you need to do that in person. And I say the same thing to the consumer. That's right. Of course, uh, different customers for different financial needs because we have a plethora of different needs. If it's a simple transaction, maybe I'll rely on, um, uh, just a, a, a web-based platform. I'm going to use my power to insert myself in with a question <laughs> now. Um, what what thoughts uh, might you have, Alex, on uh, somebody I perhaps don't have a position after my bank has merged, which is something we've been talking about. So I right. think here's a new entrant. How about I go and work for them? And uh, we did speak in the preparatory sessions before today. Uh, Chase is making a big play here in the UK. And uh, in there, I'm looking on the web page at the moment, uh, our story, they say, introducing Chase. Did you know that millions of banking customers in the US already trust Chase to look after their money? You can bank on us, 56 million digital customers in the US, and now we're launching in the UK to offer rewarding banking. It's a promise to every customer. So there's there's Chase making a big play um, for a new market. What about the opportunities for somebody's career of of joining a new entrant? Are there risks associated uh, with joining a new player? You, you know, look, as you rise in the management ranks of banks, uh, mm -hmm. you still you still have it, but it's becoming tougher and tougher to find a banker who's been at one bank for 25 years. So yes, there will always be risk, but you, you have to do your due diligence. And that's where relationships with other members in our industry is important. As you segue from one institution to another, Not you don't want to do that too many times, but if an opportunity is given, and I know Chase is opening up a digital bank in London uh, and in the UK. Uh, I saw the interview with Jamie Dimon, uh, their CEO recently here in, in the States. Uh, look, that may offer opportunities uh, that 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 you should take uh, advantage of, uh, and whether it's in the UK or wh wherever, whatever country you're from and, and are currently living in. Uh, so I, I think keep an open mind, do your due diligence, do not be afraid to take calculated risk in your favor. Uh, you know, yes, we all get, you know, fat, dumb and happy and satisfied uh wherever we are because you know it's human nature 
Uh, but, you know, it, it might jolt us a little bit uh, in making that career move. And, and I can tell you, it, it's exciting. It's exciting. Uh, and, and it's something that you really need to closely look at if it advances your career. Uh, but, you know, you have to be cautious. You, you don't want to be seen as a job hopper either. Uh, but, you, you, you know, because you want to be committed to uh, and be loyal, be seen as someone who's loyal, not, hey, someone offers me 5,000 pounds, I'm jumping ship. Uh, no, no, you don't want to be in that position because you you got to be satisfied with the workplace. You know, you got to, the person, if you're happy where you are, you it's not all about the money. It, it's not just about the money. You got to be satisfied that you're recognized for your contributions in, in, in your current workplace. And if you are, and the money's not bad, you know what? I stay there. But if you see a great opportunity that uh, that recognizes your talents, look, that happened in my career. Uh, uh, before I joined the Florida Bankers Association, I was an intellectual property attorney. And I did, you know, 70 page intellectual property agreements. And it's something I enjoyed to do, but it really wasn't me. Uh, when I joined the banking industry, more of my skill sets were used in this position than in my previous position. And after doing the due diligence, I decided to join the banking industry. Great. I mean, I think that's an interesting uh, application of the term due diligence. Normally, we might think in financial services, did we do, and you say your bank examiners come and say, did you do due diligence? Too many D's there. Did you do due diligence on this company before you lent to them or this person before you lent to them? But equally, due, di due, due diligence for uh -huh. yourself before you move. I'm going to move on from all the D's. There's a question here from uh, Stephanus Basson who says, uh, Alex, will third party credit decision making tools ever replace banking relationships? And he goes on to say, as banks get to do more and more regarding compliance, which indeed we've spoken about, and the need for it. I'll finish the question, but uh, Alex has already got a card for us to look at. As banks get to do more and more compliance work and get less time for relationship management, do you see an opportunity for third party brokers? Over to Alex and his card. Here in my hand is the 23 commandments of lending that I uh, wrote during the financial crisis on what type of loans to give or not to give. And to that specific question, uh, that is banking 101, risk management. I, you know, where banks got in trouble, I remember talking to bankers during the financial crisis in 08, 2009, 2010, many allowed the credit decisions to be made by that third party. And that third party did not have the credit standards that that bank had. And, and that's really, other than getting a, a, a fine or a regulatory order because you had anti-money laundering lapses in your uh, program internally at the bank, the only other way banks get in trouble is not by marketing the wrong piece or, or, or some other issue. It is by lending money to, and those loans go south, as we say, and become troublesome and people do not repay. And that's usually when the economy also uh, tanks. And at the time you made the loan, that loan was good, uh, but keep the credit standards within your institution. Where banks have used third parties to make those decisions, long-term it has not worked out. And, and, you know, and, 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 and what I recommend all bankers to do globally is have a loan committee, uh, have a loan committee to look at loans have a debate within yourself, within the bank, uh, and, and critique your colleagues who are originating that loan if you're on the loan committee. Or if you don't have a loan committee at your bank, create one you know, of four or five people to discuss each loan on whether it should be approved or not. It, that's the type of, of attention each loan deserves because as they say in New York, bada beam, bada boom. You, can't, you just can't approve these things uh, quickly, uh, really a lot of due diligence and thought has to be put into it because that's the most important thing a bank is doing is lending its capital out to third parties. And you want to use your own credit standards. 
Well, I'm not quite sure what the Welsh equivalent is of bada beam, bada boom uh, in New York. <laughs> uh, but um, I think, uh, as I mentioned earlier on the Florida Bankers Association homepage, they talk about learning from the past. And the uh, example that Alex just gave there of talking to bankers after the 2008, 9, 10 financial crisis, which is a global crisis, of course, was you get into trouble if you give other people who perhaps don't have, using a phrase that uh, Alex used earlier, they don't have a reputation to lose in quite the same way. The bank has uh, the risk of losing its reputation and you're only as good as your last piece of publicity, negative and word of mouth. As we draw things to a close, I can see in here uh, that um, somebody, uh, Adinke Maria Badnos, has asked a question uh, and it's been answered by Lisa from the uh, Chartered Banker team here at Bangor. Are the short courses that Bangor has that can build somebody, a chartered banker, into a fintech expert? Uh, not overnight necessarily, but Lisa answers, yes, there's a banking technology and fintech module that you can take in isolation. Um, and... Uh, Adenika, yes, by all means, discuss this offline uh, with uh, Lisa. And Stephen, I just saw a question pop up. Uh, someone, uh, and then it went away. I, I I don't see the question now, but. Uh, I, I Okay, I, I see them all. Uh, and one of them from Lenore says it might be this one, if, that's, if it just popped up. Uh, uh, Lenore says, are we seeing a pattern of banks using forced attrition to manage M&A? the pressure of cost management causing attrition. I presume perhaps, Lenore, do you mean about the attrition in terms of the human resource or what? Just clarify that a little bit, Lenore, in the chat area, please. Yes, okay. So perhaps that's the one you saw pop up and then disappear. Yes. Are we seeing a pattern of banks using forced attrition of their human resources to manage merger and acquisitions uh, and the pressure of cost management causing attrition. I think you've touched upon that when you say there will be some people who who uh, don't find a new role uh, and uh, if it's difficult sometimes they could see it as an opportunity. Any last thought on, on you're faced with uh, uh, a change in your career? Uh, this is perhaps an ideal question to draw things towards a close. You're faced with a change because of a merger and acquisition, some other reason, uh, uh, and uh, how do I step forward from that? You know, Lenore, excellent question. And, and let me tell you what I have shared with bankers here and what I have viewed here in our marketplace. But again, this is, I think, globally. So you have a merger. Uh, most of these banks are publicly traded, so they have shareholder pressures, analyst on on the stock market whether it's a FTSE, whether it's a dow or whether wh whatever stock market it is of, of the country you're from there's pressure to to you know bring both banks together efficiently uh and, and show the analyst that the merger is working uh that uh you you're, you're you, you know you're you, you know bankers use this trademark uh, how efficient is the bank uh and, and, you know, they, they don't want to be overstaffed, but not understaffed. So they're trying to find the right combination. But at the end of the day, yes, when you do have mergers, uh, there will be people that will be let go uh, because you, you can't have two sheriffs uh, on board. There's only going to be one uh, in each category. So what does that mean? But look, in our industry, uh, the, 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 the skill sets are broadening so that it just isn't for banking those skill sets that you're developed. So let's take someone in compliance. You can go work for another industry uh, because at the end of the day, you know about compliance and you know how to learn about compliance. You may go to the medical profession as a chief compliance officer for a hospital or for a medical group, or you may work for you know Amazon, or you may work for another company or another industry uh, if you're a financial person, if you're a comptroller and you're doing or you're the chief financial officer in a, in a bank merges and there can't be two chief financial officers, you can be the chief financial officer for another company uh, and, and take that opportunity. I hate for you to leave our industry, but I want you to do well. And so you've got to, as we mentioned earlier, do the due diligence and look out and, and abroad to see how you can be enhanced because of this merger and the fact that you've been left out uh, and, and unemployed. So, which is a, a, a position that none of us want to be in. So, 
Uh, I think the skill sets that are being developed in our industry are not just for banking, but they're for other industries as well. And and but I want you to stay in banking. Don't get me wrong. I want you to be there. But if the circumstances arise and you got to make that decision, do what you need to do. OK, and I think that's uh, very relevant uh, in the field of uh, higher education as Bangor University is. Of course, we we say to our um, students, these are very rarely so narrow the skills and insights that we're giving to you that you can't transfer them. And, and Alex there has given some uh, really good examples of being able to transfer across to different industries, uh, not least of which was an earlier question about all industries are being measured these days by those ESG, environmental, social and governance criteria. Um, OK, one last question here yes. and then we'll draw things to a close. Adenike says, hi Alex, your statement brought this question to mind. Most bankers have just one skill set apart from those in specialised fields. How can we diversify, especially those who have spent most of their career lives in banking? Well, that's probably a good one to draw things to a close on, Alex. It, it is, and let me tell you what I've also experienced. Um, you know, I've seen bankers, uh, you know, leave our industry and they told me, Alex, I'm moving on. I'm going to join a tech company. I'm going to join, you know, what, whatever the uh, example was. Uh, that they were leaving. You know what? They came back because once a banker, always a banker. They miss being a banker. They miss sitting down if they were a lender, uh, making the dreams come true to, to that family saying, you can buy that first flat, you can buy that first home, or here's the capital to start that business. They miss that. Banking is a noble cause. It is magical. It is wonderful what our bankers do. We get a lot of critics uh, in the media, uh, and I deal a lot with the media and and uh, and politicians, and they like to slam our industry. But you know what? Uh, our bankers are no different than any other professional industry. We need to get paid. So for our services, uh, I mean, you can't go to a dry cleaning store and give them ten uh, shirts to dry clean and not pay them for that. Well, the same thing with a bank loan. If you get a bank loan, you got to repay it. Uh, because people do not understand how well regulated we are. And, and if a bank's capital is re being reduced because you got to write off that loan because people don't repay it, the regulators may close the bank down and then everybody loses their jobs. So, you know, it's an important role that banks play in our society. And it's a noble one. And, and I have found that bankers have missed it when they have left the industry. So, uh, but again, you know, Keep in this ever-changing world that we're living in, uh, you know, always, if you have any opportunities for training, take it. Uh, but in, in our changing world, uh, the skill sets that bankers have learned and will continue to learn now are being applied to other industries as well, more and more. So, uh, you know, and again, I encourage you to stay in our industry, but keep your options open. Great. And as we draw things to a close, um, it's great to be able to see in the chat area that uh, different delegates uh, are saying to each other, well, if you want to pick up some of these skills, come on the CBMBA, uh, which is uh, not the sole purpose of having this uh, this session with Alex, uh, but uh, yes, indeed, uh, come on to the CBMBA and broaden your toolkit. Just to close things down before I thank Alex for his Great insight. The uh, one of the things he said earlier on was that uh, Florida bankers exist for uh, advocating for the industry. And there was a comment that came up that we didn't have a chance to, to look at. I'll just go back to it. And it says uh, it was in the discussion we had about how to uh, how to fund uh, entrepreneurs and the great example of the owner of the Jackson Jaguars that uh, Alex shared with us of Mr. Shakan, who went into a, a, a small bank. Um, somebody said earlier, unfortunately, bankers may be enthusiastic and willing to try to do these things, uh, but the systems don't always allow them. Now, that may well be true. And of course, um, uh, as Alex has emphasized, we exist in a regulatory environment 
around the world. Subtle differences, but at the end of the day, uh, to protect customers. And uh, one of the things that Florida Bankers Association does and the Chartered Banker Institute, our professional partner here in the UK, is they advocate for industry. If there are situations where bankers would be willing to do things but find that the systems, the regulations don't allow them, then the uh, these associations and institutes uh, are there to help us all. And that's why it's important to, as Alex said, maintain your networks. It's not just a relationship with an individual colleague uh, or perhaps in a different bank. It's about networks. CBMBA uh, wants to be that source of networking for our alumni. It also, the Chartered Banker Institute, our professional partner, emphasizes, please stay in touch with us afterwards so that you can keep up to date with all the things that we're finding out. And uh, Bangor University and the Chartered Banker Institute want to be the knowledge uh, source for you all and to be able to exchange ideas and then, as the uh, Florida Bankers Association does, as Alex said, advocate for change so that uh, things can be better for all the stakeholders. And Hedillion says networking globally is key. Uh, and uh, I'll use the um, statement from Hedillion that says great session. Alex, it has been a great session on That's the... True. Uh, on the screen as I see it, I see Alex smiling as uh, as I've always known him over the years. And there are three individuals there who are from Nigeria, St. Helena and from Trinidad and Tobago. And they talk there about the CBMBA program being real life, relevant, revolutionary. Um, gain Help me to gain confidence and come away feeling inspired, says um, Josephine from St. Helena. And I hope all of us, I certainly do, come away from this session with Alex feeling inspired. Okay. Um, there are always challenges out there. Uh, yeah. See them uh, uh, as this idea of not a cup half empty, but a cup half full or a glass half full. I should be going to recharge my coffee shortly. I look forward to sharing coffees with you in a few weeks time, Alex, when you're over here. Thank uh, you so much. No, no, Stephen, thank you. You know, Stephen, you were great. You were fantastic. I really enjoyed uh, the Q&A with you. But but I, I got to tell you, the students were unbelievable. They were fantastic, and uh, uh, and and it it shows what a great education they're getting at Bangor University. I can congratulate all of you. Uh, and, and Stephen, I have an offer. If you want to send me their emails, uh, I will be more than happy to add them to my email list because uh, uh, I would like to stay in touch with them uh, to put into practice what I'm preaching. Uh, and uh, but they were fantastic, Steve, and I really appreciate the, the questions from the students. Great. And uh, I also would echo uh, what Alex has just said. These sessions could just be Stephen and Alex speaking to each other, which we <laughs> enjoy doing and we'll be doing more of in a few weeks time. But the real value comes when you all get involved uh, and you ask questions and you probe uh, and you persist uh, and then you say things to each other in the chat area. Yeah. You know, come on the CBMBA, you can get an insight to that. And yes, we want to have global uh, connections, global networks. At the end of the day, financial services is a global industry. Much of the regulation is common. There is some specific individual national legislation. But I hope you go away inspired by some of the words, well, all the words that Alex said, but particularly banking is a noble cause. Banking is a noble cause. And remember the, the other phrase, bankers make dreams come true, whether it's for individuals in retail banking, whether it's for corporate customers, it's about making people's dreams come true. There we are. It's uh, somebody's asking about uh, recordings and the, the material is recorded. I'll leave it to Danny to explain or email out how you can uh, access that. Alex, thank you so much. Great session. Have a good day there. Thank you. Great seeing everyone. Great. Yeah. I'll see you soon, Stephen. See you All soon, okay? Thank All you. Best, Alex. Thank you. Thank you so much.